Grand Home Furnishings, a family tradition, is made possible by Lazy Boy and Sealy. Thanks for your many years of support. For 100 years, Grand Home Furnishings has been making a difference. A difference in the lives of the customers who enjoy the fine furniture in their homes. We want our customers happy. A difference in the lives of the employees who have found a home in the Grand Family. We are a family, no, no doubt. And a difference in the communities who benefit from Grand's generous spirit. We want them to know that Grand is there. Reaching the 100th anniversary is a milestone that few retailers reach. So what makes Grand so successful? It all goes back to the hard work and vision of George Cartledge Sr. My dad ran a grocery store when he was 17. He was the oldest of five children. And it was during the Depression. And the guys that worked in the furniture store all wore ties. And he wore an apron. But he wanted to, he wanted to dress up. He wanted to wear a tie. He, he liked the looks of the people across the street. But they weren't hiring because it was during the Depression. So he finally got them to give him a chance. And he said, I'll work for you for six months for nothing. At the end of six months, you can pay me what I'm worth. The company paid him in the form of partial ownership when they opened another store called Southeast Wholesale Furniture. Then in 1945, they bought a third store called Grand Piano in Roanoke, Virginia, which had been in business for 34 years. In 1950, my dad persuaded them to give, take his minority interest in the old company and give him the store in Roanoke. And that's sort of the way we started. But the Hash family really started in 1911. Grand didn't start out as a furniture store at all. It was a piano store in the heart of downtown Roanoke. It wasn't until the 1920s that the Hash family began adding some furniture to their sales floor. They also had Victrolas, as you would imagine, and you know, I mean, radios were a piece of furniture, so it was natural that you'd buy it at a furniture store. And when George Cartledge uh, purchased the company in 45, uh, that's the point at which they started saying, you know, we need to kind of get out of some of this uh, music-related merchandise and concentrate more on the pianos and the furniture. You know, after the war, World War II, which ended in 1945, a lot of the furniture factories had been turned into munitions factories. So the bigger furniture companies could get shipped furniture for their sales floor. Well, he was a small dealer in Atlanta, and, you know, they wouldn't ship him. So he went to Mr. Wade Kincaid, and, and asked him to make this bedroom suit. And he said, well, I make cedar wardrobes, I don't make bedroom suits. And my grandfather, being the consummate salesperson, worked out a deal with Mr. Kincaid and said, I tell you what, if I sell your first four cuttings, and that's a furniture word for, we'll make 500 suits this time. If I sell your first four cuttings, will you go in the bedroom business? My father had never made anything that large or complicated, of course, but he told Mr. Cartledge that he would be glad to try to make this. So Mr. Cartledge, he got on telephone and he called people at Haverty's and Rhodes and, and people all that he had known through his uh, contacts. And basically he got commitments for 2,000 bedroom suits. That's how we got into the bedroom business. By 1951, Mr. Cartledge began thinking of ways to expand the business into other communities. We do market research today, but uh, market research then was probably a trailer load of pianos. So they loaded up a trailer full of pianos and drove it to Radford, Virginia on the weekends. We had a trailer fixed up with steps and carpet in the trailers and curtains on the side of it. We'd sell it and if we had, we had people with us a pickup truck and if they wanted to deliver it, we'd deliver it right on the spot to them. Until one weekend, the crew arrived to open the makeshift store but ran into a little trouble with the sheriff. They dug up some old law that you couldn't have a part-time store, so they wouldn't let us open the store that morning. In response, Mr. Cartledge opened full-time stores in both Radford and Covington. The next store to open inspired a custom that we still enjoy today. In 1953, Mr. Cartledge wanted something special for the grand opening of the new store in downtown Lynchburg. They gave away a plastic mirror about that big. It had a calendar on one side and Cokes. And you can see the results in that picture. They had to block Main Street in Lynchburg 
because so many people came for a free Coke in that little mirror. So my father decided if people want a Coke that badly, we'll give them a Coke every day. And that started a tradition that is uniquely grand. Welcome to Grand. These people are our guests and it's just a way of welcoming them and we're very strict about it. I had a man tell me recently, he said, you know, I only came in here to get this Coca-Cola. And I said, guess what? The reason we gave you the Coca-Cola was to get you to come in here so we're even. Today, Grand hands out over a million Coke products a year in their stores just to thank people for walking through their doors. And you know, that would be a good cost cutting but it's a company tradition now, and as long as we can, we're going to continue to give out Cokes. Grand continued expanding in 1957, this time into Charlottesville. The company bought a, uh, an operation up there called M.C. Thomas, which was a furniture company that had opened in 1907 and we operated uh, under that name into the mid-80s. Mr. Cartledge was constantly thinking of new ways to grow his business. My dad was convinced that little girls needed to have access to pianos that were reasonably priced, so he was determined to make a piano you could sell for $400. At the time, about the cheapest thing you could buy was about $800. My father and Mr. Cartledge uh, <clears throat> derived a plan that, that uh, we could use my father's furniture making expertise and, and uh, grand pianos selling and marketing expertise and started a new company. And we did that and uh, called it Grand Piano Manufacturing Company. So not only was Grand in the business of selling pianos, but making them too. In 1961, Grand also picked up a valuable member of their team and family, Robert H. Bennett. Bob was George Cartledge Jr.'s brother-in-law he took a strong leadership role in developing new store locations. Up until his death in 2002, he was instrumental to Grand's success, and his son, Robert G. Bennett, carries on his father's tradition. Through the 60s and 70s, Grand pushed forward, opening new stores and acquiring other furniture stores for the first time outside of Virginia. The company picked up Ball Brothers Furniture Company in Bristol and United Furniture Company in Kingsport, Tennessee. They also opened a store in Hagerstown, Maryland. During this time, Grand cemented its image that sets it apart from other companies. You know, it, it is our family business and the people that work in the company are part of our family. Uh, you know, when you spend 35 years with a company, as a lot of our uh, fellow team members have, that's, that's a lifetime. Um, and we're grateful to them, but they also understand my grandfather's values as to ultimately how we want the customer taken care of. I've been through a few hard times with, uh, with illnesses with children, and uh, the Cartlidges and the Bennetts stood beside of me, you know, I mean, they they care for me like I was their own. And uh, it's, it's always been such a, a great feeling of family. That feeling is one of the reasons so many people have stayed with Grand throughout their careers. A gentleman named Fred Flora um, fought World War II. I don't know how many people know anybody that fought for General Patton, but he was one of them. And when the war ended in 1945, um, when he moved back home, he started working for our company in 1946, and he's still there today. Well, I, I went to work at Grand Piano, started repairing radios and record players for about a year. Then I, then I took over the warehouse as manager of the warehouse. George Carley Sr. had a way of uh, getting you to do things that you never thought or realized that you could do. 1980 saw the company open a small-scale mall in Roanoke called the Grand Pavilion. It was anchored by a high-end store called Grand Interiors. During the 80s, Grand also tried to help communities with fledgling downtowns, propelling Grand's business model of renovating vacant department stores. What was nice about that is it, it breathed new life into some of these downtowns that otherwise had these big hulking empty, vacant buildings right in the heart of their downtown. And so it was good for us because we could get a building uh, inexpensively, but we could also help make the downtowns a little bit more viable. 
Then came the flood of 85 in Roanoke. We had had all this rain for like a week and then a hurricane got stalled over Roanoke. Grand's flagship store downtown, which also housed the corporate offices, and its exchange store two blocks away, started filling with water. Water just started coming up through the floor. It was just kind of bubbling up through the carpet. I was petrified. Water was up to my waist in the store when we were rescued. And I think there were about uh, probably 10 or 12 people in the store at that time. Um, but they, we held hands and walked up to number one fire station. And a lot of people there never got home that night. I was stuck. You know, I figured I was gonna spend the night at the firehouse. And George Cartlidge Sr. was sitting there right next to me. He said, well, you're coming home with me. When it was over, Grand held a flood sale of the furniture they had salvaged. And people just uh, saw it as an opportunity to buy something that they could clean up and, and make uh, into something nice. Far bigger than the one flood sale is Grand's massive warehouse sale held every year for one weekend near the end of February. In 1991, Grand opened its flagship store at Valley View Mall in Roanoke signaling a permanent switch to mall area stores. Today, the Grand Home Furnishings in Lexington is the only downtown store the company still holds. As years progressed, the shopping habits moved out of the downtowns and into wayside areas where shopping malls were. And at that point, we started opening where the customer wanted us to be. A later renovation to this store included a full-size merry-go-round with hand-painted horses. We had a woman who worked at a competitive store recently who's a friend of one of our salespeople. And she said she thought this family was getting ready to buy this furniture. And all of a sudden this little kid looked up and said, when are we going to Grand where they got cookies in the merry-go-round? And it just ruined her sale. Those kids that ride our merry-go-round today, 20 years from now, they're probably not gonna be shopping somewhere else. So many businesses look at the children and say, don't touch anything, don't sit on anything, don't mess up anything, and our philosophy is totally opposite of that. Around that time, Grand also consolidated its warehouses. For years, there was one for each store. But in the 90s, the company combined into a few regional locations and built a massive distribution center in Roanoke. Someone is having a party, a special anniversary sale party, and you're invited. As Grand moved into the modern era, so did its marketing efforts. The company had put a lot of emphasis on newspaper and television advertising. But in 1994, Grand recognized the growing popularity of NASCAR and the chance to gain the support of its loyal fans. We started out by working with a race team out of North Carolina and they said, well, we could create a grand piano and furniture race car, and we could run at races in Martinsville and uh, Bristol and other locations that were near to where you had stores. And that sounded like a good idea. The first driver Grand teamed up with was John Andretti, a newcomer to NASCAR, fresh from the Indy League. We then later decided that, well, you know, we should be at all these races. So we got an associate sponsorship where you didn't have the entire car, but you had uh, the hood and, and maybe the rear quarter panel, and we uh, got with Jeff Burton on that. In 1996, Grand hooked up with the Wood Brothers race team out of Stewart, Virginia, with Michael Waltrip as their driver. Michael Waltrip in the Wood Brothers Ford takes off. Uh, we had a very good relationship with them because their values were very similar to ours. There is a family-run uh, race team and uh, one of the oldest multi-generation teams in the business and uh, a Virginia-based company. They come from an old family, you know, it's generation after generation and, you know, we're part of the original deal here and we kind of understood family values, family problems, you know, things that go, you know, how all that stuff can, can, can go and, and uh, so it just all fit. Hey guys, the car's a little tight in the turns. By any chance, did you go to that big sale at Grand Home Furnishings? Yeah, I got some great deals on some great furniture too. How'd you know? Lucky guess. We did appearances for them like at Christiansburg, Roanoke, Lynchburg, 
number of places. They always had a big turnout because there was, there was always, because um, who, whoever was the driver or whatever would always need to stay longer than usually the two hours to get, you know, to get everybody. It was a relationship that went beyond business. It was one family partnering with another. And, you know, they were very loyal and it, it was, you know, they were like family. I mean, it was just like dealing with your own, own people. You know, it was really, really good relationship. Graham stayed with the Wood Brothers through 2003, when NASCAR really started spreading out beyond the southeast, where Grand had stores. Grand also invited soap opera stars to their stores to sign autographs. And when they connected with Doug Davidson from The Young and the Restless, again, it was more than a business arrangement. They formed a friendship that has lasted more than 15 years. I guess the reason the, the, the relationship went on for so many years is because from my very first appearance, they treated me like family, and that's exactly how they treat their customers. And the customer response to Doug was overwhelming. They wrap around the building and line out the door. I mean, it's, it's nice to see the support of the fans for him, as well as to see him come into our store and be able to uh, bring a little bit of Hollywood into Virginia and, and our board in Tennessee and West Virginia. And they went out of their way to make sure that every fan got to meet the star. There was a, a 90, 93 or 95 year old woman. They set up an entire uh, living room in their, uh, the back of one of their stores so she could have a, a, a personal appearance without having to stay in line. He uh, would, would stay long after the scheduled time making sure that every customer and every fan of his was uh, recognized and, and thanked for being in the store. And Doug always appreciated that Grand remains a family-owned business just as the Young and the Restless was. Our creators uh, Lee and, and Bill Bell wrote the show and, and, and uh, kept it running smoothly for 30 years and they did this because it was their own show. And I think the same philosophy from, from George Sr. Uh, has passed through uh, th three generations. The company also operates under a new name now. In 1995, Grand opened a store in South Carolina under the name Grand Piano and Furniture. Then in 1997, the company opened a second store there and called both stores Grand Home Furnishings. George Cartlidge Jr. was there for the opening and at that point in time we didn't we had not handled pianos for several years and a lady came in the store there during the opening and really gave him what for uh, she got right up in his face as a matter of fact and said you don't have a blip blip piano in this whole store how do you call yourself grand piano and he got to thinking about it and said, well, maybe it's time to drop the piano, literally. We did an elaborate uh, commercial, which was kind of cute back then. We've dropped the piano. Now we're just grand, grand home furnishings, because we don't sell pianos anymore, just quality home furnishings. Nobody ever called me and, and cussed me out for changing the name, which I expected somebody to, you know, to do, but it never happened. Through the years, Grant has enjoyed the good times and survived the tough times. We had a fire in Winchester and we reopened that store. We opened it as Grant Home Furnishings. One of our employees came in very early. He logged onto the computer system and then he started smelling smoke and began to realize that, hey, there's, there's something going on here. So he calls the uh, fire department, but uh, it was very unfortunate. You know, the, the store just was engulfed in flames. Uh, people wondered, you know, was Grand going to just, you know, pack up and leave at that point? Well, it was just a matter of a couple of weeks before we found a, uh, a, uh, an old hotel that had been vacant and uh, operated out of that uh, hotel for a year or more and uh, subsequently we built a, uh, a beautiful new building uh, outside of downtown uh, and opened and have had just tremendous success in, in Winchester ever since.
but one thing that has always stood as a beacon to grand success is the charitable nature of the company. As a corporate uh, entity, this, this company gives the legal limit um, to every imaginable charity needy situation that you, you could possibly imagine. Well, that was Mr. Cartlett Sr. He's always felt that way. He said you had to give back wherever you take out of a community. You got to give things back to it. He originally set it up as the Cartlidge Foundation because he did not want to have the company get credit for the contribution. He didn't want it to seem like it was a promotional tool. Uh, he basically wanted to give it, you know, uh, basically wanted to give it anonymously. Mr. Cartlidge also donated several buildings to charity. He and an, another lady developed Center in the Square, which was bringing all the cultural institutions into one uh, building within the valley, and it was to help revitalize downtown. Um, years later, uh, after he'd passed away, uh, the center was in need of another building, and we had vacated our main downtown store, which was one of his favorite buildings uh, that he, when he first moved to Roanoke. And so we, made, we donated the building to Center in the Square for them to use for the art museum. But we, we try to support organizations in all the towns we're in. You know, I think so many companies that are, have branches, you know, everything comes to the town where the home office is. We try to support, you know, other, other communities where we're doing business because we feel that same obligation there. The employees also have a way to give back through the Grand Benevolent Fund. Every employee has the opportunity to put a small portion of their paycheck into this fund and uh, the uh, Grand Home Furnishings, the owners of the company, match that fund. And then the stores in each area uh, can choose where that goes to in their community. George Cartledge Sr. continued to be involved with his company even as his health was failing. He was there every day, even when he um, you know, was not feeling well. Uh, he would have uh, someone to bring him to the office. One of the last of a generation of Roanoke Valley power brokers has passed away. In March of 1997, George Cartledge Sr. died at the age of 87. He honored this code of living every single day of the week with everybody he came in contact with. We still have people talk about his influence and his perspectives today here in Roanoke. He was a good and kind person. He was almost like a brother to me. I used to travel with him a lot around to the stores. Some of the salespeople, they said, that's a beautiful tie you got on. He'd pull it off and give it to him. The company now runs under the leadership of his son, George Cartledge Jr., and his grandsons, George Cartledge III and Robert G. Bennett. You know, he, he always said, be nice to everyone, uh, especially your customer. Um, be a good citizen uh, personally and corporately and give back to your community. And those values we've carried on to the third generation. We've not deviated from them. Now Grand Home Furnishings has established a new foundation for its 100th anniversary, the Grand Happiness Foundation. It's time for us to, to really uh, uh, say thanks to the community after our a hundred years of their support. Grand's strength has always been its people, so the year-long anniversary celebration kicked off by busing all of its employees into Roanoke for a banquet. It was a thank you day to the, to the team members. I mean, they're the ones that have made this company what it is. Uh, my grandfather had the vision, but without the people that worked day in, day in and day out, uh, it could have never been the success that it is today. It was the one day that Grand shut down entirely to make sure that everyone could come. This commitment to its people is one of the reasons Grand enjoys such strong loyalty from its team. All our store managers have grown up from within the company. We've got some wonderful stories about people that were hired as porters and associates and delivery people who are now running their own stores, their own Grand Home Furnishing store. And throughout the anniversary year, Grand is taking its generosity to a new level. A hundred grand gestures is our intent over the course of uh, 2011 is to have each of our stores and warehouses do two, three, maybe four 
major efforts in their community. Uh, we've asked each location, each one of our stores and warehouses, to personally select what, what organizations they would like to support. You know, we can go into a, a battered women's shelter and refurnish it and remodel it and have, we think, more of an impact than just throwing dollars at a situation. And that's what they've done. You'll see people in blue shirts helping out all over your community, like in Roanoke, delivering more than 50 mattresses to the Salvation Army's Turning Point Shelter for abused women and children. Or doing handiwork at Bethany Hall, which offers long-term substance abuse treatment for women and delivering new mattresses for their beds. In Harrisonburg, team members planted food at the Salvation Army's community garden and hundreds of other gestures in the communities that Grand serves. From a corporate level, we wanted to also pick an organization that we could do um, company-wide. And we've partnered with Habitat for Humanity, and we're going to go in and um, get people that are sleeping on the floors off the floors. We're going to put them in, in bed so they can have a good night's sleep. This is a simple statement, but I call it the golden rule. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. That's kind of the way we run this business. We strive to give better customer service each day. Uh, we are always open to new ideas. We don't feel like we've done it all. There's more that we can learn and there's more that we can do. I think if you look at our stores, all the employees are happy. And when customers come into our store, I mean, they see this and feel this. You know, if, if our people are happy, they figure they're going to be happy with their furniture when they buy it from Grant. And uh, I, that's, that's a big deal to me, to, to make people happy. I mean, that's, that's what we do. Ultimately, that's our goal, is making people happy. Grand Home Furnishings, a family tradition, is made possible by Lazy Boy and Sealy. Thanks for your many years of support.